I've been working in a mitochondrial lab for five years now, and I stumbled across this video wherein a mitochondrial researcher explained a number of things that we can do to improve our mitochondrial health. If you're not sure why mitochondrial health matters, well, then I'd encourage that you check out my video on the topic. But in brief, mitochondria are implicated in just about every disease state known to mankind. And healthy mitochondria are heavily related to, well, a healthier you. I go into the mechanisms and much more detail in the other video, so I won't repeat myself, but a healthy version of you hinges on healthy functioning mitochondria. So we're going to listen to Dr. Picard, this mitochondrial researcher, speak on what we can do to improve our mitochondrial health. And I'm going to take your hand and walk you through your mitochondria to explain things in more detail. There are unfortunately plenty of lifestyle things we can do to ourselves to to uh, decrease our mitochondrial function and decrease our mitochondrial health. And the big ones that seem to get a lot of attention are, of course, nutrition and then sort of poor sleep and toxins and so I mean, how do you see the the main um, the main detractors from mitochondrial health that unfortunately we do in our society? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're pointing to what I just described were uh, inherited, you know, mitochondrial disorders, and then they're acquired mitochondrial disorders. Real quick, it's important he makes this distinction between inherited and acquired mitochondrial disorders. Inherited disorders come from your mother. If your mother's mitochondria have some form of defect, your mitochondria are likely to have a defect. As one example, I covered one of these genetic defects in a live session that I did with the Physionic Insiders. Therein, I described the mechanism of a known condition known as Lieber Hereditary Optic Neuropathy, or LHON. Essentially, the condition occurs due to mutations in one or multiple of three genes, which causes defects in a critical mitochondrial protein heavily involved in cellular energy generation, complex one of the electron transport chain. Ultimately, these kinds of conditions are extremely difficult to treat, but there are some solutions like drugs and supplements as we learn more about reducing the dependence on that protein for cellular energy. The second distinction that he makes is related to acquired mitochondrial dysfunction, which comes from what we are exposed to for the most part. I'll give him the floor. So all of the acquired you know, result from our exposures and, you know, kind of internal exposures. <laughs> We're studying how psychological states and cr exposure to chronic stress or early life adversity and, or the uh, kind of the, dis the disorders that <laughs> we can create ourselves either psychologically or through, you know, nutrition and, and other things uh, and how they can influence mitochondria. So this is all part of the acquired you know, mitochondrial um, impairments or dysfunctions. Um, so there's a number of things there that converge on on mitochondria, including diet, which is a, a very big one. Everything we put in our mouth ultimately converges either directly on mitochondria or, you know, around the, the metabolic pathways that mitochondria are involved in regulating. Uh, so that's, you know, a very big one. Uh, there's a lot of good research on uh you know, insecticides and pesticides and uh, some of those that were used, you know, back in the days were we use at the laboratory as poisons for mitochondria. So he goes on to describe these poisons and how they're used in the lab, but I'll describe that to you with visuals. So he also mentions nutrition, another area that we'll dive into in more depth in just a bit. But the overall idea is that your habits impact your mitochondrial health. In extreme cases, poisons like rotenone, which was used as a broad insecticide, also affects our cells, unfortunately. Dr. Picard goes on to then describe how we use them in the lab. As a matter of fact, I've actually poisoned using rotenone before, and I'm looking for a place to stash the body if you know anywhere. I kid, of course. Although, I have used rotenone to poison cells by inhibiting mitochondria. This poison works at the exact same site as the mutations mentioned earlier, complex one of this chain of proteins that allows the mitochondrion to generate ATP, cellular energy. So the takeaway here is avoid poisons and otherwise toxic substances. 
Granted, not exactly revolutionary advice, but we're warming up to more. I can feel it. Also, I watched the video, so I know what's coming up. What can we do to promote, you know, good or to optimize mitochondrial health? Uh, energy transformation or, you know, proper mitochondrial signaling. Uh, there's not a lot of, uh, there's a need for more research on this. That's the you know, first thing I want to say. Uh, there are three things that we know can optimize and improve, you know, mitochondrial energy transformation capacity based on kind of scattered research over the last maybe two decades. One thing we know for sure is moving, uh, being physically active, right? So I think many people know, you know, exercise is uh, a protective factor against, you know, many, uh, you know, mental illnesses um, and uh, exercise is a protective factor for pretty much every disease that we know of. And if we flip this, if we think about health, right, as not just the absence of exercise, but this ability to thrive and and to um, and and to you know live a long healthy life, uh, exercise is good for this. So moving stimulates and pretty much inside every uh, organ that people have looked at uh, stimulates the production of more mitochondria. So if you move, the body feels, oh, I need more energy. How how do I handle this? Let me make more mitochondria. That's called mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, and we know that this this happens, you know, a lot. For example, in muscles, uh, if you go from being completely sedentary uh, to training for a marathon, you can double the number of mitochondria in your muscles. All right, number one, which is a hundred percent true and cannot be emphasized enough. I covered this extensively in my master's program in exercise physiology, but let's look at some actual studies as well. Dr. Picard mentions that moving being physically active has tremendous benefits to improving mitochondrial health and number. The latter, the mitochondrial number, can be increased through a process called mitochondrial biogenesis. Every time I say that, I always think to myself, like I'm sitting on top of a massive canyon with a booming voice saying, and it reverberates through the expanse. Anyway, my delusions aside, how does this work? Well, your muscles are filled with millions of myocytes. Those are muscle cells. These muscle cells, when activated under strenuous or continuous load, aka lifting weights, running, they contract. Now, it's really remarkable how much I'm cutting out here. I'll always remark that because I, it often feels so unsatisfactory to me, but uh, we also have a lot of information to get to, so please excuse. Anyway, contractions of the muscle cells require energy. So your muscle cells use mass amounts of ATP, the cell energy that I briefly mentioned earlier. As such, downstream product molecules of ATP begin to increase in concentration within the cells, like ADP and AMP. Additionally, calcium is in great use during the whole process for reasons that we can't really get into right now. Just know that it's highly involved in muscle contraction. So elevated calcium and elevated ADP and AMP lead to the activation of the master mitochondrial biogenesis molecule called PGC1-alpha. PGC1-alpha then enters the nucleus of your cells and activates a variety of proteins called transcription factors. These transcription factors sitting on the genes within the nucleus begin recruiting the gene reading machinery to begin producing downstream proteins that are part of mitochondria. Once these mitochondrial proteins are produced, they are integrated into new mitochondria born from mature mitochondria. And that is the highly truncated version of how we produce more mitochondria. For reference, see this study, although there are many others that detail this as well. Okay, so big picture, if you use your muscles, the mere action of movement causes a chain reaction. And more often, within reason, you move, and are physically active, the more this occurs, generating more mitochondria. That is crazy cool. This whole process is especially true for cardio exercise, even over strength training. So being hungry once in a while is healthy. <laughs> and, 
we evolved, you know, to do this. And the reason why being hungry is is not eating too much is is healthy is not too clear. Maybe it's because it puts you into ketosis. Uh, maybe it because it's because it prevents nutritional or metabolic oversupply or you know overload. People have done beautiful studies in, in cultured cells where you take cells and then you bombard them with sugar and with fat. And so that causes kind of, there's too much energy supply relative to what the cells need. And this causes within minutes, the fragmentation of mitochondria. So you go from having a beautiful network of connected and you know dynamic uh, mitochondria talking to each other to a completely fragmented mitochondrial network. Being calorically or nutrient neutral on average, this is also excellent input. And there's plenty of research that has come out on being overweight, as one example causes tremendous changes to mitochondria. One area that I would caution is not to overinterpret changes in mitochondrial structure as positive or negative. Dr. Picard mentions that when cells are exposed to significant nutrient load, there is mass shrinking of mitochondria. It just so happens that I've performed these experiments myself in the lab, and I can 100% confirm these massive changes in mitochondrial morphology. However, when looking over the literature, this is merely an adaptation by mitochondria to increase their burn through or oxidize of nutrients. So this fragmentation as seen here in green allows mitochondria to waste more energy. Clearly, this is a reaction to massive nutrient overload, as we'd see with obesity, although this is possibly a little bit more extreme. Still, repeat exposure to high nutrient load does eventually cause issues. I'll give you a little fun fact about my experiments at the end of the video in relation to this effect. Stay tuned. Anyway, though, making sure not to overconsume regularly, so we're talking about months and years, not the occasional day, is critical for healthy mitochondria because mm. excess food consumption over time burdens mitochondria with needing to burn more energy as inefficiently as possible, which can, in some cases, increase oxidative stress or damaging molecules that are produced by the overburdened mitochondria. Mm. But let's hear Dr. Picard speak to this nutrition aspect just a bit more. So the magic question with fasting though is how long? And I know it's like impossible to answer with with certainty, but you know, time restricted eating, it can help reduce calories, maybe, you know, it can help reduce insulin and improve um, insulin sensitivity to some degree. You know, probably like a minimum of 12 hours, maybe has to be 16, maybe has to be 18. Do you have any sense when it comes to mitochondria where the sweet spot is, or it's just clear that some amount of it helps and we still need to learn more about the specifics? Yeah, I think it's it's clear that some amount of it helps. I don't know that we have the right evidence to be prescriptive here about how long should you fast. And it probably depends if if you're on a ketogenic diet, right? And and you or you have a you're on a low carb diet, maybe you don't need to fast for as long to to you know derive the benefits than if you're on a, a regular, you know, a high carb diet. And maybe, you know, each person's metabolism is is pretty different. And it's clear that some people respond a lot better to uh, you know nutritional ketosis than some others. I don't have much to add here except for one thing. I think that he nails it with the uncertainty on how to be prescriptive about fasting in regard to mitochondrial health. If anyone on the internet is telling you that they know exactly how long, they're lying out of their rear end. That may change in the future as we gain more data, but as it stands, here's how to approach fasting for mitochondrial health. One, focus on doing it in a sustainable way. If that's only 12 hours a day, then so be it. If it's longer, that's great. Two, focus more on the overall ability to reduce or maintain to a healthy weight, not the actual fasting length itself. The fasting will help you achieve that healthy weight, if you find it sustainable for you, but there is no evidence yet on the optimal amount of fasting on this mitochondrial metric. Hopefully that will also be changing in the near future. You know, I guess I do have a second thing to say. It probably does matter which nutrition style that you choose, but again, we have no data on mitochondrial metrics. So focusing on the big picture of maintaining a healthy weight 
no matter if that's using high carb or low carb or whatever, is ultimately going to trump some nebulous idea that one diet is more optimal than the other diet. There isn't enough data on that topic yet. How you feel, and, and I'll focus specifically on positive psychological states, might actually drive changes in your mitochondria. And, um, and we did a study a few years ago with Alyssa Eppel, uh, UCSF, where they uh, took about 90 women who, um, who were asked every morning and every evening how they feel. And then, you know, you imagine you wake up in the morning and then you're asked, how do you feel now, right? Do you feel, you know, inspired or do you feel, uh, you know, confident about your day uh, or do you feel worried and you don't know what's going to happen today and that's really stressful to you? And then in the evening, there was kind of a more elaborate uh, questionnaire that asked, how much of this did you feel today? And then there were kind of items like love, closeness, and trust, and, uh, you know, being inspired and motivated and uplifted and, you know, connected to others and so on. And then some negative things like feeling betrayed and, uh, you know, rejected and feeling sad and depressed. And um, and I think everyone, you know, can, can imagine some days you feel a lot of positive stuff, right? Like you had a, a great day with your partner, or with your colleagues at work, or so you felt a lot of positive things and not so much negative things. And some other days, you feel a lot of negative things <laughs> because of things that happened, because of your, you know, psychobiological state, you know, whatever this, whatever drives the emergence of those positive negative experiences. So they ask those questions. So we have kind of reports on how women feel for seven days in a row for a whole week, which is beautiful, you know, uh, daily repeated measures of, of someone. And then we, uh, we, we, we're able to have white blood cells, immune cells from these women on measured on the Wednesday. So they answer these questions from, you know, this, the, the Sunday to the Saturday for these seven days. And then on a Wednesday, they came to the clinic, gave blood. Then uh, Alyssa's team isolated white blood cells. And then we assayed the mitochondria. And then what we measured in the mitochondria there is we call the mitochondrial health index, which is basically how much energy can each mitochondrion transform? Right. So that's kind of a proxy for a simplistic proxy for mitochondrial health. So we were able to to relate for the first time how people felt right across that week and, and their mitochondria in the middle of that week. Um, and so we asked, you know, a, a simple question uh, first. Do people who feel more positive have better mitochondrial health than people who feel more experience more negative things, right? Uh, and and the answer there was you know, yes. And it seems like people who experience more positive things have slightly better mitochondrial health. Uh, but then the more interesting question was, well, we know how uh, these women reported feeling for the three days before we took the mitochondria. And then for the three days after we took the mitochondria. So we can ask, is it how people feel that predicts right? Or drives the mitochondrial health? Or is it the mitochondrial health that drives and predicts how people feel, right? Um, and the, what the study showed is that how people felt uh, in the morning and the evening uh, on the three days before, on the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, actually predicted mitochondrial health, uh, but not the other way around. I'll be honest with you. I have never heard of this in my life. But I'm also not the all-knowing purveyor of all things science. I'm learning too. Fortunately, I have a unique set of skills that allows me to poison, not those skills. Uh, I have a set of skills that allows me to interpret molecular data. So let's see if we can find this study for you. Bingo. Actually, I'm not even sure if the term bingo fits here, but let's roll with it. I'm not going to get into all the intricacies of this data because that would involve, again, more time than we have. But I'll point out one piece that illustrates his point well. In this data, the researchers, Dr. Picard being one of them, identify the association between morning and night feeling of wellness. So binarily separated as negative and positive. The horizontal axis is the effect size or the magnitude of the effect. I'll go ahead and, and tell you that all the effect sizes listed up to 0.4 are small, but let's play along anyway. So they are comparing the mood that a person is in to the mitochondrial health index, which is a measure that they created. They find, especially at night, that if mood is positive at night, there is a relationship with improved mitochondrial health. That's pretty fascinating stuff. 
but I'll need to dig into this a lot more to get a complete picture. Plus, the study is associative. Still, I think it's pretty neat and kind of makes me reflect on my unending stress levels. Maybe it does for you too. I guess the takeaway is buck up, chap. <laughs> or just take care of your mental health. It's important. Oh yeah, and I nearly forgot. I mentioned a fun fact in my experiments on mitochondrial fragmenting. Well, while Dr. Pigard mentions this occurring with combining lipids, so that's fats with glucose, sugar, I've actually done it with only fats, so no sugar. And the effect is extremely rapid, just taking a few minutes. So while I wouldn't jump to any conclusions that fats are bad for you based on that information, I just want to relay that glucolipotoxicity, the process of too much glucose and fat simultaneously, causes this reaction. It can also happen independent of glucose. Pretty neat, huh? Anyway, while we've covered a lot here, I actually have a lot more mitochondrial content right here. And I think that you'll find it illuminating if you found anything in this video interesting. Or if you care to switch gears, check out this other video, which is also filled with data-driven conclusions. Now, where did I leave my rope known? 